All right, I've been trying to get a little bit of tuning down here, running into an issue. This tank is getting so hot, you can't even touch it. It's like gonna burn your hands. And IAT2s are about 200 some degrees, just barely cruising down the road. So I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have to get this thing up in the air, get this wheel out and get into the EMP pump here. I'm sure it's cavitating and it's not even circulating fluid. Uh, I'm probably gonna weld a bung in here too and see if we can catch some temps with this intercooler fluid and get a better handle on what's going on here. We need to get this sorted before we can go further. All right, got it up on the uh, good old quick jacks here in the building. I normally try to do it out in the driveway, but it's getting late and it's supposed to be raining tomorrow. So I'm gonna lose the day of work if I don't do it in here. Went ahead and threw some big five ton jack stands because the ground's not exactly perfect in here and it's, it's a little sketchy and I was afraid it would slide on just the quick jacks by themselves, but we're good now. I'm gonna go ahead and get this front bumper off, get this wheel out so I can get out all the access to the cooling system, the fans, the pump. Gonna get this tank out so I can start modding it. I think the goal is to fix the cavitation issues, the main goal get a uh, sensor in this tank so that we can get intercooler readings fed in so we can see better what's going on possibly address this lid that seems to like leaking and these fans are so obnoxious well we can't see them but they're behind this cooler so i'm going to try and put a fan speed controller on here and see if we can take care of that because it needs something better all right with the bumper out of the way i can see we've got a catch can on this corner over here it feeds from both valve covers there's the afco GC500 sized heat exchanger on here. It's got dual 10 inch fans I can see back behind it. A long sandwich inside of there is a transmission cooler also with a fan. I'm not sure how all of this is wired up exactly. I'd like to trace that and see if there's anything we can maybe improve on so it's not so loud on cold start. Yeah, and here's the EMP pump. And if you look from the point where it actually comes out of the reservoir all the way over to the tip of the furthest end out here, we have about 13 inches. So if we flip this around, it's going to come way in. Here's the, let's give you a reference, here's the rotor. It's going to be way in up over here. Uh, that's just way too much interference with the wheel. And even if we try to tuck it back under here, we got the alternator right behind here. Really can't push it much in there. So uh, I'm not entirely sure what's going to be a good plan here. We're going to have to go to the uh, drawing board for a bit and think about this. Pump's busy running right now, doing some testing. It's getting a little warm, it's been running for a few minutes. One potential issue I'm finding here is there's a circuit breaker up here that's wired in line for the power for that pump. And it appears to pop sometimes. It's just kind of like a circuit breaker in your house that you pop and reset. So I think that might have been cutting at times, causing us issues. Uh, right now, as you can see here, all I did was go into the test modes on here and you can just turn various features on and off. Just turn the pump on, pretty handy. I think with the extra power from the alternator when it's running, it's probably overpowering this. And I, and I have a feeling because it's getting warm right now, and I just know in my own personal car, I had to wire two 30 amp relays in parallel to share the load because they were getting so hot. Because this thing draws so much power. Okay, at this point, I'm not gonna change the orientation of the pump. Uh, I really wish I discovered the power issue before I pulled everything apart. But as it stands, I can't tell the difference between when the pump was cavitating and when it was losing power. So I could be wrong about its orientation and cavitating. Uh, wouldn't be the first time I'm wrong about something. <laughs> so instead, I'm going to go ahead and just make a few changes to help me diagnose this better. I'm going to go ahead and add a coolant temp sensor in the reservoir so I can data log, so I can get the coolant temps of the, the fluid. And I'm going to go ahead and add a flow sensor in the line from the pump so I can gather actual uh, flow data. And we'll, we'll send it right into the MS3 and data log it. And hopefully that'll give us some good data along with the intake air temps of the motor as to what exactly this pump is doing. And then we can assess from there and decide how we want to address this. Finally, <laughs> never removed one of these front tanks before, so I wasn't sure what all was involved, but I had to loosen up the power steering and reservoir and move it over and this inner coolant tank here for the engine's um, coolant. And I got that off now. All right, I can tell there's a bolt down at the bottom here that I'll somehow get to as well. And then I should be able to pull this up. Well, I wasn't the first to weld on here. I guess the drain was added. I didn't realize that. I thought it was just part of the package. This here, I believe it's dash 20, and it's, it's freaking huge. 
You wouldn't believe it. I got this fairly decent sized crescent wrench here. <laughs> it doesn't even get on there. I'm gonna have to go find a bigger tool. Wow. All right, I went ahead and dropped this tank back in here. And it's because I got a little bung here with a temp sensor and I'm mocking up some locations up in the front area here where I think it'll go. It's really tight all around, so I have to make sure I'm gonna get clear so once it's welded in, it actually still fits in there. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and undo these screws around here too. I've got one out already. They have a, there's a nut on the back and just back them out. I'm gonna see if hopefully uh, there's maybe an adhesive I can put between this base piece and the metal. I'm hoping there's nothing there because this lid leaks quite a lot. And I'm hoping most of it's coming out of there and not between the top lid piece that turns on, but I'll find out soon enough. And then uh, one last thing I might try and take a look at is this, there's a, a baffle in here to deflect fluid that comes returning in, but it kind of just wiggles around and is loose. I, it doesn't look like it was welded in. I think someone just put it in there afterwards. Uh, I don't know if I can adhesive it in or, I don't know. Once I, once I get this little ring off, I'll look a little closer and see what I can figure out. Okay, I got this ring off of here, had a look at it, and it did have silicon around it. Although it didn't have silicon around the actual screw holes, but really, as, you know, as tight as those go down and as tiny as they are, it may have been weeping some fluid out here, but definitely not leaking to the extent that it was leaking. It was quite a lot. So that means the leaks come likely coming between this lid and this base piece. And, uh, you know, it's a pretty tight fit. However, there is a sticker in here, and it says that the gasket in this product requires uh, periodic maintenance, including replacement. And they have a URL over here. Hopefully I can get this thing to start sealing. This big tack bump over here turned out to be the biggest cause of a leak. The lid was unable to sit flush and fluid was just gushing out the side there. Also, great news, I found a tack weld on this um, baffle over here. So if there's just one, one tack on one end, that's why it's kind of floppy and you can wiggle it around. But it's not going anywhere, so I'm not gonna do anything with it. It's, it's perfectly fine just like that. Found this awesome a leak at least, it was just this connection on here. When I put a wrench on here, it was so loose, as soon as I started to put pressure, it just spun right off. It was almost finger loose. Uh, glad about that, it was nothing serious. It's just a loose fitting, so there's always the easiest fixes. So we're gonna bung weld it in right here. There's the fluid exit. We're gonna take a GM temp sensor, put it right in here. Feed that into the MS3 and data log the fluid temps inside of here. I also noticed there was a big bump over here from the weld that had melted up and pushed up. Uh, that probably wasn't helping this seal any, so I went ahead and ground all the imperfections off the top of this cover. And uh, we'll go ahead and probably get this powder coated again. I was going to paint it, but it kind of matches the other tank under the hood, so probably try and powder coat it. Okay, we got our tank back from the powder coater. Look how nice and shiny this thing is. It looks fantastic. Of course, now we have a bung in here for our temp sensor. Got our drain on the bottom added, and we'll go ahead and get our lid back on here and get this back in the car. Okay, before we put this temp sensor into the intercooler reservoir, we're just going to double check it. I got it hooked up here to the laptop, wired. I had to make a little circuit for it. I'll explain a little bit more about that in a few. Um, seeing about, what's that, about 79, 80 degrees. The coolant temp sensor in the engine is going 71, 72. So there's a few degrees difference there. Okay, first test, some ice water. This should give us about 32 degrees Fahrenheit. I watched the temperature drop down here and it looks like we're bouncing around 39 degrees. So that tells me my little bias resistor here might be for voltage divider circuit. Uh, I could use a little bit of tweaking to get that in, but this is why we test. All right, phase two of this testing, I went ahead and stuck it down in a kettle and I turned it on and let it get up to a boiling temperature. And I'm watching the temperature climb here. And once again, so this should be about 212 and I'm seeing about 218-ish or so. Once again, confirming this is uh, give or take eight to 10 degrees higher than it should be. So I probably need to adjust that resistor. All right, let me explain what was going on with that resistor on the circuit. On your MS3, you have, among other inputs, you have temperature sensor inputs and analog inputs. And when you run out of temperature sensor inputs, you can use analog inputs as temperature sensor inputs. You just have to modify them a little bit. So let me explain. I think if I show you how a temperature sensor input works internally, it'll, ma it'll make more sense. So what, inside of the MS3, you have a five volts reference here, and it comes along and it goes to a resistor, which then connects right there to the temperature sensor 
connection. So externally, what you're doing is you connect your, your temperature sensor over here and it goes down to ground. And internally, right at that point there is where it's, it's reading the analog voltage. And that's how it gets the temperature. Essentially what you've done here is you have a voltage divider between this resistor and this resistor. There's gonna be a voltage drop. This run varies its uh, resistance based on temperature. It's gonna go up and down. And this varying voltage here is what's read and is how it figures out <clears throat> excuse me, the temperature. So if you run out of temperature sensor inputs and all you've got left is an analog one, you can run that out, tap off the sensor five volt supply. So you have a five volt sensor supply and add your own resistor externally, just like that. And now you can add your coolant sensor down to ground. And this analog portion here is reading a voltage just like it reads down over here. And we've just created our own temperature sensor input. So what resistor value do you use? Well, I looked up in the manual and what's internal inside of the MS3 is 2.94 kilo ohms or 2940 ohms. I personally, that's what I use today and I personally never have spot on luck with it. Um, when I connect sensors to the actual temperature inputs, I seem to have great success. <laughs> so I don't know if the documentation I found is old or, or not quite right or why it doesn't work exactly right. What I do do is though, I have a whole bag of resistors and I'll just sit and play around with some very close values or maybe sometimes just daisy chain a couple to split values or however I need to do. And I'll tweak it and I'll do that same ice water and boiling water test you just saw until I have it sensing spot on. Uh, but that's essentially it. So if you have extra analog inputs and you ran out of temperature sensor inputs, you can make it work. All right, I got my temperatures pretty much spot on. Look at that. They're, they're within a degree. And, um, <laughs> so I have a little network going on. I didn't have the exact value I needed. So I ended up putting a 6.8K and a 10K resistor in series across there, but parallel to that one to create the ultimate resistance that I needed. Hey, look at that. We actually have our ice cold temperature sensor now that reads ice cold temperatures. Perfect. Hey, we got boiling temps that actually show up as boiling temps within what, two, three degrees. Fantastic. And while we're on the topic of temperature sensors, I know I've mentioned this before, but it's worth mentioning again, not all of these GM temp sensors are made the same. You do your ice water tests, uh, boiling tests, whatever, and it reads spot on. These sensors are accurate. On these other sensors, you know, I'll buy like, here's four different sensors, I'll get four different readings. It's crazy. And sometimes 10, 15 degrees off. Bad data is worse than no data at all. All right, time to get this ring back on. Need to get silicon all on here, all around these little holes. Well, let's back reinstall. I'm gonna let the silicon dry overnight before we do anything more with it. Unfortunately, I don't have a new O-ring for it yet. Uh, still waiting on that. Uh, seems to be so many delays on items right now. But I'm hoping it's going to seal better all the same because there was that, that bump on the metal here where the tack weld was here. And there was a lump over here that I grinded out. So now that this is sitting more flush and smooth, I'm hoping we'll get better luck even on the old, old ring. We'll find out soon enough. Goodness, I feel like I'm working on the railroad. A massive train or something. <laughs> Hopefully no more leaks from that. All right, let's get our intercooler installed. Get our new sensor plugged in. Right. Next time we're gonna go over that flow sensor, show you how it installs and how it works. It wires directly into the MS3, it's pretty cool. Got the circuit breaker upgraded, so this pump shouldn't be cutting out anymore. We're making some progress. We'll get to it next time.